Hello everybody, my name is Eric and today we're going to be taking a look at another batch of dodgy open source projects. Except these guys figured out that they don't have to be open source, they can just use GitHub as a false sense of security. Now these are another set of what I would call implausible projects, crypto brute forcing. Now the idea here is given that access to cryptocurrencies is just based on having a seed which is functionally like having a password, well in theory by chance you could generate that seed and take the money. So why doesn't this work? Well because of the length of the seed and the chances of doing this. Because it wouldn't just be a brute forcing issue, it would also be an issue to random users getting the same account. So as a result, the odds of doing this are astronomically low, and without advances in quantum computing, it's functionally impossible. But that hasn't stopped a group of sketchy projects propping up on GitHub that promise to deliver this. Now if you've ever wanted to understand why it's a ridiculous proposition to brute force cryptocurrency, our sponsor can help. This video is sponsored by Brilliant, the interactive platform that lets you iteratively learn through complicated subjects at your own pace. Brilliant has a bunch of great courses on various STEM subjects, such as how large language models work, and the mathematics that actually make up the basis for cryptocurrency, or the probabilities that would tell you how unlikely it is to randomly guess someone's private key. Brilliant makes it easy to learn anything you want to. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for the next 30 days, you can either scan the QR code on screen, go to brilliant.org slash Eric Parker, or you can click the link in the video description. It'll be right there at the top. Now back to our main programming. Now these are a great category of potential victims, because if they have cryptocurrency, they're probably a good target for an info stealer campaign. Now we got a couple of these different names, Crystal Tool, Crystal Tool, Ethereum Private Key Generator, and Balance Checker. Now this one I'm not as sure if it's dodgy. Ether Finder, Bitcoin Brute Force, Cryptocurrency Catcher. Now given that these tools wouldn't generate a single wallet with anything in it before the heat death of the universe, you have to think there's probably another incentive here. So let's take a look. Now we've got an MIT license, which is always a good sign, but there's no code here. Look, we've got license, read me, no other branches available, no tags, no issues, no forks. So there is in fact, only thing that makes this look a bit legitimate is botted stars. These are just fake accounts that stalled this repository, but are they're bots. So let's try downloading this first one. So we got Blazing Tool, and then we got Crystal Tool. Now this is release.zip. I have a feeling the second one is going to be passworded. If you don't have a RAL archiver, you can download it here. This isn't even a RAL. And you need to disable antivirus as well as update Visual C. Good advice. So we extract it out, and we've got a few interesting files. It's got bits of a Java runtime that may or may not be relevant. And then we've got some random pieces. Now some of these could be malicious. First thing to do is let's see what installing file underscore x86 has any detections on virus total that might give us a hint about what we're about to install. So it's an encrypted payload. Now what about the DLL? Because the increasing tend has been for, well, even Defender gets it, so I'm going to guess this is probably malicious. Malgent MSL. Benefit of using a DLL is you can either ship a DLL that's imported by a legitimate program, or failing that, you can at least uh, ship a DLL that does most of the work, because most people, if they do use something like VirusTotal or a sandbox, they might just think to upload the executable. Now here we are getting hordes of detections. I think I may have actually seen this payload before. This is definitely malicious. Now let's also take a look at the crystal tool, because there were a couple uploads of that, which is never a good sign, and it's even got a picture of a stereotypical beautiful hacker man. Now there is actually a zip file in the code, but of course it's not code, and it's instantly getting a hit from Chrome, so we have to disable the safe download. Want to get it? You can go here, you can go no protection, and then it'll let us download it. Oh, but Defender doesn't like it either. Oh, and this one's actually got the Unicorn Luma Stealer Defender detection that I've never seen. I've never, the only time I've ever gotten that, naturally, was after dumping a Luma Stealer using X64 debug, at which point it's unpacked, and that makes more sense. So let's see what we got now that we've allowed 
we've decided, you know what, Lume ain't so bad. So we got the loader and some DLLs that probably don't matter. I almost, I'm half expecting, given it's detected, that it's actually going to be, it's unpacked and it's just going to say, the, do you want to run a malware prompt? Let's see. Malicious file. Small screen also knows that this is not something you should ever run. And Defender blocks the second stage, so it doesn't actually get to run. That's interesting. So another DLL payload going on here? Well, I'm not complaining. I will turn off Defender later so we can actually see uh, the full operations. But it does seem like this one got caught. Not exactly brilliant uh, stealth here given this was uploaded quite recently. So let's go look at Launcher Setup V5. I'm more interested in this one because it seems like it might be a bit more sophisticated. I have a feeling this could be another one of those auto it don't gates. Just a, just a random guess. I'm just going to see if Defender really did get rid of... Okay, it did get rid of the very obvious Luma. So let's try uh, installing file x64. We can see if there's any TCP. Yep, uh, we're already going to a command and control server. And then we get an error, which could be real or it could be fake. Now what I'm going to do is go to procmon and trace anything that happens with this installing file.exe. Wow, it opens all the antivirus DLLs so that it can get that. And then it, then it goes to a temp file, writes and deletes this delays.temp a million times. It's a really strange way of detecting, uh, of trying to hide. Uh, oh, we got some crypto functions being imported. I'm going to remove the registry ones because those are really noisy. You can see this a bit more clearly. I'm just going to see if there's anything left over in temp. No obvious indication of persistence, so we're just borrowing some content from your system, sending it up, and then pretending that it never happened. It's a good strategy. Also got an OVH server, which did nothing wrong with them as host, but it is unfortunately a host that sees a reasonable amount of abuse. Now out of interest, I'm going to turn on MITM proxy. Oh, let's try Launcher Setup 5 again. And this one, I'll pull this up so you can see it. This one uses the Steam community as its command and control server, er, and then from there it finds the real command and control server, which currently seems to be boardlight.sbs, and it opens a telegram link. So this is actually a different stealer from once. It's still a stealer, but it's, it's a different one than we usually get. Let's actually see where this telegram link goes. We could, in theory, contact this person. I'm not going to do that, but then we hit, oh, I think there's supposed to be, oh, and uh, Chrome just closed, so that means the Stealer on Chrome probably just ran. And then we go to this site. And we send our Chrome debug, Chrome browser version.txt, and then the API should send us some more browser version. Important files, downloads. Oh, that's interesting. So it's, it's actually scanning. Oh, no, it's just because it's got the word password in it, so it thinks it might be something of desire. Then we get Discord, of course, system.txt, and then this is just some information about the system that was just hacked. And then it gets a base64 message. That's how the command and control works. Now I want to go back to procx and just see where this file has gone. And ultimately it deletes itself, which is a relatively uh, common trick for non-persistent stealers because it makes it harder for the victim to figure out what's happened, and you could even think that the file just didn't work. Which I guess on one hand is kind of true, but there's just a bunch of other random files in there, that's why it looks the way it does. Now we can open this up in the debugger. I'm going to hook socket, because we know that it uses that for command and control, and we've now gotten a request to socket, which is called from WinINAT. So it looks like there is actually... Let's see where that goes. Of course, whenever you're called into a function, uh, you can simply go to the top on the stack, and that's where it'll return to. Put a breakpoint here, and then we get where it returns. So after getting tired of crawling APIs, I decided to look at the program in static analysis, and I quickly figured out that the installing file x86.64 underscore 1 is simply a loader to the rydgx86 DLL, I swear I've seen this setup before somewhere, but I went through my videos and I couldn't find it. So 
So uh, here's what we've got here. We've got what could, what well, probably somehow this gets turned into a PE header, but I'm not entirely clear yet how the unpack algorithm for this one works. What is notable is there is a very high volume of zeros, so it's probably something more than just a simple XOR. Now I also found the unpack function, that is this jmpower function, which is cooled by the other program. Now interestingly, Binary Ninja seems to never succeed at loading the high level intermediate language on this, but we can use the medium level, which is like a half decompilation. Now we have a bunch of addresses here that correspond to bits in the packed region. This is a massive function, as we can see, even in medium level IL, which is not one to one. This one looks a bit like the payload in the city skyline, where it all happens within the code. And we've just got this is a monster function. And the final oh, so it's just a go to at the end, and it's probably a loop of some sort. Okay, so it's just going through lines of code. So there's sort of a there's a loop going on here to unpack is a absolutely massive, massive chunk of binary. And then we return. So let's look at the call out to this function. So we call it here, and then it's in stall, which is another function that cannot be decompiled with high-level intermediate language right now. Okay, so we pass a memory address to it as an argument. At least I'm assuming that's what... Maybe it's not. And then we have a similar looking function in here. So I'm going to restart uh, over on the dynamic analysis. I'm going to restart and hook that DLL call. See if this is in fact... Okay, so it's not a memory address, so then it's some sort of constant. And here we have the section we suspect is the packed binary. So let's just put a write breakpoint on this. So that if anything happens here, which it would have to in order to extract this, uh, we'll see. So the breakpoint was hit, then we've got a fairly simple iterator. So if I put a breakpoint here, we now have a very different looking collection of data. And I'm actually going to go back up and just see what what did this uh, loop do. So we move uh, the pointer here to EAX, then we add, okay, so nothing, nothing super juicy. And this isn't a valid PE. But that doesn't mean it's not something of interest. Now I'm going to save this out just in case this ends up being of interest. And this blob of memory is 0xce3e0 big. And we also have to add, of course, the, the destination. Now I'm le going to click the run and then we're going to leave the memory breakpoint there. Okay, that's interesting. So there's multiple stages to the unpack. That's kind of what I was expecting because that still doesn't look like a PE, and I assume that is the final destination. And then this will jump us all the way up here, and run this loop until EAX hits a, a desired number. And now it is a valid PE. Looks like the unpack is now finished. We can now upload this to virus total, get an idea of whether this is a known, known piece of malware or not. And then we might actually get a name, since this will be the unpacked version. I'm going to be kind of annoyed if it's just Luma Steeler. I don't think it is Luma Steeler. I think this is actually something. Steeler C. Vidar. Haven't seen that in years. But that, that could be, I could believe that. Yeah, these all seem about right. Also, I get a fair number of comments asking how do you unpack malware. I have made a few videos in my school about it. But really, once you've figured out the basics of understanding the commands like virtual protect things that can change the protection of memory and understanding breakpoints. It's really not that difficult. All you got to do, unless you're dealing with something like VM Protector Thamida, which you, unless you want to spend hours on it, you're not going to get. But if for 99% of stealers and similar payloads, all you got to do is just find, you'll find either a, a function that creates a big array or you'll find a big blob in memory. And one way of finding it, like I did, is just put a hardware breakpoint on it. And something that's helpful is having a hexadecimal calculator. I just use a Python terminal, but just being able to do the simple offsets with hexadecimal so that I can dump the right size of the binary, well, that just makes life a bit easier. Now, given this is still in the VM and not on my main system, I'm just going to try and use Ghidra to get a 
overview, and then we could possibly export this to the main system for more analysis. Let's we'll see what the behavior has to say about this. Oh, it's going right uh, to cookies. That's not such a good sign. All right, they, the Ghidra, that's not set up right, so I'm just, I am just going to get this onto the main system and take a deeper look. And now we're in. Now, we've got everything we need here, and we can see this actually isn't that obfuscated. Nothing like Luma Steeler's horrifying in control flow flattening that takes a day and a bunch of symbolic execution scripts to clean up. This one's pretty digestible. So we got, now this section simply seems to run some of the commands, but some of the stuff I thought was more interesting if we go down a bit is I saw some anti-emulation techniques. Now what you may not know is a lot of antivirus these days will use emulators as a method of preventing dealing with packed malware and just being able to see the behavior, rather than only being able to do so after it's already ran, at which point cat is out of the bag. If you could detect the malicious behavior ahead of time by emulating, it'd be great. So what malware will do nowadays is they'll have things like this where, I, to my understanding, this is looking for potential indications that we have this string. If, we ha if our computer name is hal 9th John Doe, we are not going to run. And this is either going to be that, or it could be, it could also be emulation. It's not a super well-known one, given it's not on Google. And there we go. And then there's some other potential string comparisons here. If we detect that, we exit. And if we don't exit there, run that. And then we create this delays.temp file. So we get the temp path. Now here we've got more anti-sandboxing. Got current user, sandbox. IT admin, Johnson Miller, user, sandbox. User seems like a really high risk of false positive. Sandbox, malware, maltest, test user. They're really trying to make sure that testers don't get it. And that, that could actually catch even just a human testing, because I've used user and sandbox before. But um, if we don't, there is a lot of anti-analysis here. And here we're checking if we have Monero. This is actually a part of the Steeler routine. You can see lots of totally normal safe behavior if we look through these and we can see these select queries, which of course are going after data that is likely to be browser cookies. Here we have a hit on the Steam. This is stealing Steam credentials. This looks like it may be the main Steeler loop. So let's see where that is. Yeah, so after these anti-analysis functions run to make sure we're not in an emulator or sandbox, then we go right to work and we start stealing all of your data. Now, the main tool that sandboxes have against this kind of activity is by randomizing these parameters rather than leaving them as static. If they leave it as static, it becomes extremely trivial for any malware to just test them out, just upload your malware, especially if it's a stealer, you just upload it and then you get it back. This is a, a string encryption and memory allocation function. And here we can see the result of decrypting these. It's a simple enough algorithm. You just put in the... And if we wanted to, we could make a binary ninja script to automate this process, but for now this does the job. It's just two strings, one of which is XORed by the other. I think I actually have the, the key and the... The decrypted one mixed up, but that doesn't really matter for the purposes of understanding what's going on here. So that is going to be all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this look at why you shouldn't download uh, random, especially impossible hack tools on the internet, and a look at how s the inner workings of Steeler C. Uh, a simpler Steeler than Luma, but still it seems to be pretty popular. That's all for me for now. Bye.